Hi, this is Paul. Um, some of you know by now that all of the plenary session talks from the Northwestuary Conference has come out. Uh, people in the corner might be annoying you and how much they want to talk about this conference. It was a pretty amazing conference. It, it really was. And I think the fact that so many of us are still sort of reverberating in it is testimony to that. And while, as, as many will share, so much of the power came from the estuary breakout groups and the quality and power of the conversation that happened in those groups, it was also a conference of, of remarkable presentations. Now, I already put the video of my presentation out there. Why add commentary to that when it's my presentation? Although... I'm not I'm sure I would do it, but I wanted to say something and, and maybe I'll keep doing this for all the other videos as well. Just some memories. I Graham was the the one speaker I didn't know at all. And if you listen to Sherry in some of the conversations that we've had, uh, it took a fair amount of talking him into doing this. And and this was even though he knew who I was, I had to pick him up at the airport. I didn't know who he was. And he said, oh, yeah, I know you. Um, and in, he watches he watches my videos, and he talked about that on this recent live stream that Sherry did over on Grail Country. I, I drove him and Michael Martin from the airport, and it was great fun having both of them in the car, just just listening to them talk. And you know, I don't want to I don't want to spill the beans on a bunch of what Graham said, but I knew when he took the stage that this would be this would be oh boy. It's so hard to compare the different presentations. But Graham's was in many ways super challenging. And I know a bunch of you are going to be triggered by what he has to say. But he gives here an honest articulation about his struggles with the church. Now, I know some of you are like, well, that's that's because he's not in the Orthodox Church. No, he, he's, he's been in the Orthodox Church since before Orthodoxy was really fashionable, at least in the, the Peugeot pipeline. And so a lot of people are going to have a lot to say about what he has to say. And, you know, fair enough. And go ahead and leave your comments. That's That's absolutely fine. I think if I had to sort of summarize in a song, there would be two points. And I made these points. We did another post-conference uh, video with Nate and Jess. And um, what else did we have there in the video? Anyway, it'll, Jess is putting it out. It'll come out. But one thing, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Uh, you can hear in his longing a longing for something that has not yet been fulfilled in his heart. And the second is, I think, an instinct against idolatry. And this is part of the speech that I gave in that other, in that video that, again, will come out on Grail Country. And I'll, maybe I'll post it on, on, my, um, on my channel too, we'll see. Nate Heil summarized it well in that one of the ways to understand the gospel is it is the reconciliation of heaven and earth. And again, there's, there's tons to unpack in that. And so often when we think about this reconciliation, we think about the reconciliation between human beings and God. And of course, if you understand human beings position as having been given dominion over the earth. Romans chapter 8 talks about the earth groaning, waiting for the sons of God to be revealed in the world and waiting for us to completely embody the redemption and restoration that the world requires. And, and his talk is uh, in many ways a cry for the earth and a frustration with the kinds of idolatries 
that churches easily fall into. So listen to his talk. It's, it's quite a talk. And I'll be so interested to read the comments on this. And, you know, if you're angry, let's hear it. He'll, he'll probably read the comments too because he does follow the channel. And, you know, part of what really touched me too was it was so interesting because Sherry was very clear, Graham needs to come to this conference. Number one, because we need to hear him. But number two, because he doesn't, he's not sort of fully receiving what this strange online and in-person community has to offer. Maybe I'll play a little bit of what he said in the live stream on on, on Grow Country that Sherry hosted. Yeah, just just from that from that angle. Yeah. That just gave me goosebumps. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're in a good uh, start then. Yeah, we are. All right. Well, okay. Well, we got that. We got the first impressions covered. Um, here's the other question. Is this real? Ooh. Is this I real? <clears throat> Maybe Graham, you want to start with that? You ready for that? I was, hope, I was hoping you'd say that. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I, I have strong feelings about that, which, which I told you. Mm -hmm. And I'm, um, you know, I would say I'm, I'm pretty, or have been pretty cynical about um, the internet as a, as as one example of of many uh, ways in which the whole um, techno social system keeps us alienated from from one another and, and from nature. Yeah. Um, on this live stream yesterday where um, the, my internet was going in and out and uh rafe kelly was like hey you know if you just pop on on your phone that might give you a better connection and i'm like this is my phone right <laughs> 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 like i and like i've been trying to yeah now like stay connected with people from the conference and like already like i can't do this because I don't, I don't have a device that's just on me all the time um i have to go down into the basement which means going away from other people and you know anyway mm -hmm. i've been very um intentional about not going down that rabbit hole of not of not um you know being hunched over in, in the screen um i've i've been cynical about it or dismissive you know this is not this is not basically this is not real um, and even part part yeah anyway um i'm really i would say i'm hypersensitive about what's real and what's not real and um mm -hmm. and, it, and it's easy for me to dismiss um things as unreal um what i told sherry was that my whole attitude had to shift with the conference because as an outsider looking in, it was overwhelmingly, I mean, I'm getting choked up just thinking about it now. It was like overwhelmingly obvious that prior to meeting each other face to face, all these people had deep love for one another and that they had really, I mean, as you were saying in a different stream, Sherry, like part of that was that, you know, you all had truly touched each other's consciousness. Um, even with all these layers of un unreality that the whole yeah. tech, you know, two dimensional screens, pixelated faces, you know, Brady Bunch floating heads. Like there's a lot of things that aren't quite People. correct about it, <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, it was like, all you people <clears throat> deeply loved each other and cherished each other and respected each other so that like the moment of first face to face encounter like people were crying and embracing um so the connection was really real and so and i can't deny that um and and it's 
is really real, but not enough, you know? Obviously, you all felt the need to come together and, and in fact, name the concert <laughs> or the, 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 not concert. It should, we should have had music, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, we the, should. The conference, <laughs> more music. We had Michael Martin. That was great. More music. Yeah, um, more music. Kumbaya around bonfires is, is what mm -hmm. I'm recommending for the next time. But um, the conference, you know, encountering face to face and, and, uh, like that was the theme of the talks and everything, but, but like the, the earnest desire <laughs> was for everyone to like, you know, virtually not alone is not enough. We actually need to be in the flesh together. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was, um, so I, I've been trying to write an essay on my sub stack about it. And then I don't know how oh, cool. well it's going and I don't know if I'll send it out, but, um, the metaphor I've been thinking of is, is of Jacob, the reunion of Jacob and Esau in the desert. Oh, interesting! <laughs> Where, you know, they're like estranged for each other for years and years. And Jacob having, in the worst possible way, way betrayed Esau, and um, finally after many years and getting married and raising children and living their separate lives, Jacob is coming back um, to his homeland to to see Esau and uh, this is the metaphor that uh, uh, you know Jacob's got a huge caravan of people you know family servants uh, camels carrying all of his vast wealth you know he's got he's like uh, uh, soldiers guardians you know um, there's this uh, and, and, he, and he stretches it out over miles and miles and keeps sending people ahead with gifts you know groups of guys to bring huge gifts lavish gifts and to say you know for my my lord esau from his servant jacob he's just humbling himself and like and, and preparing you know like esau would be perfectly within his rights to just slaughter jacob and all of his people you know so jacob's like really worried about this reunion and keep sending gifts ahead gifts ahead and then uh when finally they could see each other the two brothers um they get close and Jacob prostrates himself in the dust seven times and Esau just runs up and grabs him. Oh, <laughs> like, I love you. Um, that moment of like, so I think of the internet as like this sending gifts ahead of ourselves. Right. Um, and, and that something like that yeah. had happened. I'm not, I'm not saying there's this betrayal between people, but that this estrangement, this alienation, and that the internet is just sending gifts ahead of each other, of ourselves, um, before the reunion. And it was clear, I mean, the way that people hugged each other and, you know, yeah, Sherry was just like crying, <laughs> just like, and I don't know, I, the moment I walked in the door and we we haven't known each other that long, but, I, you know, we know each other deeply, you know, our hearts are kindred hearts, you know, so we so we know each other, even though we haven't known each other for that long. Like when I went, came to the door, I'm like, Grant, <laughs> it's like, <"Sherry." laughs> it's like, I haven't seen you for like billions of years. And finally, you know, <laughs> Here, you know, it's like, oh my God. So yeah, the sending gifts yeah. ahead and, and then the <clears throat> prostrations and then the embracing, like something real had mm. been already happening. That was obvious. And, mm. um, and now, yeah, I'm like Tracy, I, I was never involved in this before and now I'm, now I'm, yeah, I'm doing it backwards. Having seen all these beautiful faces in the flesh, now I'm like, yeah, back to back to the internet and trying to trying to connect that way. And it's, it's mm -hmm. tough, you know, it's painful because you know that it's not quite what it was. Yeah, I really love that, Graham. Like the sending gifts ahead. That is really that's a great insight. I love that. I'm going to be. Yeah. I'm stealing it. <laughs> she's not even a preacher and she's stealing it. I'm stealing it. I'm stealing it. And you can you can get a sense of his storytelling and just that image, you, the internet sending gifts ahead. This is powerful. So, all right, that's the end of my front ending. Uh, what comes next is his presentation at Northwestuary. And uh, again, leave a comment. I, I just... I can't wait to see the comments. <laughs>
If everybody could take their seats, we want to get started. We're trying to stay on schedule. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just going to make this short and sweet. I just want to introduce Graham Pardon, and Graham is now going to push our buttons. <laughs> Thanks, Sherry. Um, for reasons of style, I made this sound like I knew what I was talking about. Huh? Sure. Oh, I'm not that tall. Okay. Yeah, I, I made it sound like I knew what I was talking about, but I want you to hear it as one big question. Okay. When the wanderers are made whole again, and holy of earth, let them be lost no more. Okay, that's the title for this talk. I write everything out and I read it word for word. That's what I do. I don't, um, I'm very shy and very obsessive about language. So I write it all out. Okay, that's the title for this talk, which is supposed to be about poetry. And my epigraph is this from Nikolai Berdyaev's Ethics of Creativity. He says, our religious life is still full of idolatry, and to get rid of it is a great moral task. Creativity is, by its very nature, opposed to idolatry, and therein lies its great significance. Okay, I think, I think that says it all right there, but I will keep talking. <laughs> And what I want to say right away also from my heart, so you know where I'm coming from, is this. I used to know how to have a relationship with Jesus. Now I don't know how to have a relationship with Jesus anymore. That's the problem. And I know I'm not alone in this. And I know I'm not alone in saying either we need to return to the earth it's yellow sun and green trees. And we need to come home to one another, human face to human face. That's the problem also. And in my mind, which is a strange mind, I'm starting to realize, in my mind, those are two different ways of expressing one and the same problem. But even just to see them as a unity is itself uh, Departure from, I was going to say betrayal, that's what it says right here, betrayal. I'm, I'm going to tone it down. Departure from Christian orthodoxy, it seems. And so the place where I most love to search for answers is not so much sacred tradition as wilderness. Wandering among the shimmering but harsh oases of the rebel poets. And I do like to push buttons. But, but I'm... <laughs> But it's, it's, a, it's a question. I, I, the, the indigenous American theologian Vine Deloria Jr., a Standing Rock Sioux, said in his book, God is Red, that there's something inherent in Christianity as a spiritual culture which makes the earth itself, its bright flowers and fragrant grass, its white clouds and moss and flowing streams, feel ultimately unreal. He says, while Christianity can project the reality of the afterlife, time and eternity, it appears to be incapable of providing any reality to the life in which we are here and now presently engaged, space and the planet Earth. He says this has to do with situating ourselves more fully in history than in space. Our sense of Christian identity as universally and abstractly, not just tribally and ecologically real, coming not so much from our place on earth, the mesh of our relationships with the other living things of earth, but from our position within an inherited but not bodily experienced narrative arc from creation to apocalypse. Everybody doing okay so far? Yeah, all right, all right. 
If time becomes our primary consideration, he says, another quote here, we never seem to arrive at the reality of our existence in places, but instead are always directed to experiential interpretations rather than to the experiences themselves. Paul of Tarsus, not, uh, who, pa, Paul von, von der Tarsus, who, 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 like every generation of Christians in the 2,000 years following after him, thought the apocalypse would happen in his own lifetime, said, this is from 1 Corinthians, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it, for the present form of this world is passing away. Married life, the joys and sorrows of normal human time, the birth and loss of children, showers of sunshine and rain falling from the sky, the bloom and death of plants under the cycles of sun and moon and stars, the usual flows of buying and selling, of sowing and reaping, of weaving cloth, throwing pots and chopping wood, the entire elemental tapestry of whatever you think your life here on earth is made of, it will soon unravel, Paul says. It's already unreal, passing away. Whether or not you yourself can see its fraying edges or hear it all begin to snap. So set your minds on things that are above. This is in Colossians, not on things that are on earth. And now from the retrospective of our Holocene era omni collapse of once flourishing ecosystems, this derelict world of ours in which seabirds dying of starvation, their stomachs full of our plastic trash, and precious human beings living in tent cities of trash as if washed up on the endless seashores of concrete at the end of time are literally two of the most peripheral of our many concerns. We can say that in addition to Paul's from now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. We've been late acting lately as if he'd also said, from now on, let those who have planets live as though they actually belong to the emptiness of outer space. It is absolutely no accident, says the unorthodox, orthodox poet, theologian, Philip Sherrard, that a purely materialistic view of nature first arose not within the Hindu, Buddhist, or Islamic world, but within the Christian world. Sherrard's argument is it all began with the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing, a fabrication of the church fathers, which subverts the poetry of the Hebrews' prophetic vision in favor of a logically clean but artistically dead total abstraction, a vast black emptiness, akin to what we might now imagine as outer space, floating, as it were, quote-unquote, face-to-face with a quote-unquote God who is absolutely unrelated to it, but who has the power to make things appear from within it as if by a kind of proto-technological magic. Imagine the, the blackness of a smartphone before you touch it. You're the God in their scenario, and it's the world as soon as you say fiat lux with your Sistine Chapel finger. And that says something about why our relationship to earth has become like digital addicts sitting in the sunshine and grass, but doom scrolling pixels of narcissistic light. Amen. Yeah. I, uh, the ancient Hebrew poetry of the Bible has its own vision of creation, which is not only incompatible with, but fiercely opposed to that of the body escaping farewell to earth saying, Platonist. 
Okay, I'm back to bashing Platonism. I, uh, <laughs> I kind of, I, I, I oscillate. I'm back to bashing Platonism. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, Yah, your breath has been our home. The refuge on which our watchful eyes rest in the circle of the ages. Before the mountains issued forth in travail, before you danced forth the earth and the lush places of abundant flow, in blissful twists of agony from age to age, you are the highest one. You return man to the trampled dust, calling out, return, O children of Adam. For a thousand years of tooth and nail under your careful watch are like a single day slashed off from the present, a passing dream. They gush away. They vanish like sleep, sprouting like grass in the morning, at dawn blossoming like hay slashed down in the evening and left out to dry. We're exhausted. We're annihilated. We're eaten up in the oven, flaring forth from your nostrils. We flow away under your scorching blaze of sunlight. Uh, that's the first part of my translation of Psalm 90. Um, I think it came out pretty good. Uh, I think it's good. I mean, because uh, I wrote it. Uh, I think it's good. No, it's good. Be I mean, I like my stuff. I, because it's vivid, you know, it's earthy. You can see and almost smell and touch real stuff you yourself have, have experienced in your own body as you hear it. Refuge, breath, sunlit dust, grass, meadows blooming, the blade of a scythe slashing them away, dancing, writhing, gushing, scorching blazes of sunlight. And the reason why it's so vivid is that the Hebrew itself is. All these images are really there. Not created ex nihilo by me, but they do require some significant creative work to bring them out into our English daylight. The doctrines of the world's religions, laments Vine Delore Jr., who was once a Christian seminarian, by the way. The doctrines of the world religions expressed in the most precise phrases and elaborate concepts with every nuance of meaning represented by weighty tomes describe virtually nothing. I have that same lament. I can't stand theology. No offense. I, <laughs> uh, but I think the poetry of the Hebrew Psalms emerges from this kind of critique of meaningless abstraction, not only totally unscathed, but even melodically triumphant. They are definitely describing something. The something. The one and only thing there is for us to describe in the first place what it's like to live as a body of humans together on this harsh but beautiful earth. Sprouting like grass in the morning, at dawn blossoming like hay, slashed down in the evening, and left out to dry. Any human at all, religious or not, who is willing to feel in his or her human body the vast, horrific, an overwhelmingly lovely and tender tragedy of walking about on earth among the other earthborn, face to face under the sun as a beautiful but passing human constellation of dust, can recognize this supremely bullshitless psalm of Moses in his or her own heart effortlessly. That was pretty good. I'm going to say that again. This can recognize this supremely bullshitless psalm of Moses. That's good, man. I like that. Her own, in his or her own heart, effortlessly, frictionlessly, no requirement to first, quote unquote, believe in anything, which is one of the divine powers that true poetry has, that even true theology, if there is such a thing, doesn't. But I want, what I want to focus on in the psalm is is it one constellation of vivid bodily images in particular. Before the mountains issued forth in travail, before you danced forth the earth and the lush places of abundant flow in blissful twists of agony from age to age, you are the highest one. Okay, a more conventional way to translate Psalm 90 verse 2 would have been something like, before the mountains were brought forth. 
uh, that's the translating the, the Hebrew word yala, and, uh, before you formed the earth and the world. Uh, formed would be the translation of chol. Okay, that's the ESV, which, which is just terrible. Uh, no, no offense. Actually, I don't care. <laughs> offense. No, which is just terrible. No, it's all right. If I may say so, sucking the life force out of the underlying Hebrew and leaving the brittle shell of a distant memory in its place. Good, maybe, for left hemisphere dominant, anxious, control seeking, theological overthinkers. <laughs> because, because, because more susceptible to their tidy and therefore vacuous systems of thought, but useless for people like us longing to become fully embodied human beings again, with feet standing firmly on the planet dealing with the reality of planetary life again, face to face. Yalad means to give birth. And it's used that way a lot in the King James Version. I'm not making up these meanings. Hol means to twist or to whirl, to dance, to writhe, or to be in anguish, metaphorically. Um, so the poetic image here in the psalm is is obviously uh, of the creator as a mother in the agony of giving birth, moving around simultaneously in ecstasy and pain as a kind of dancing forth her child, the earth and all its many life forms into existence. Everybody doing all right? We're good? Okay. This is a very different way to think about what earth is than to think about creation ex nihilo. The men who set Christian thought and feeling on their main trajectories, the trajectories that would in time lead to, as Sherard says, a purely materialistic view of nature, the disenchanted cosmos we're thinking about waking up from now in the aftermath of Christianity, seem to have been mostly childless male individuals who kept themselves as far away from the hardcore, earthly, mammalian, biological, warm-blooded realities of childbirth and child-rearing as they kept the bloodless God of their own imaginations. Better that everything come from some nothing that doesn't mean anything than everything come from the wet darkness of a womb. Good Lord. Thus, when St. Simeon, the new theologian, says as recently as the 11th century that... I'm Orthodox, that's recent, 11th century, that's recent. <laughs> thus, when, the, thus when Saint Simeon, the new theologian, says as recently as the 11th century, the whole creation, after it shall burn up in the divine fire, is to be changed, that there may be fulfilled also the prophecy of David, who says that, quote, the righteous shall inherit the earth, end quote. Of course, Simeon says, of course, not the sensuous earth, you know, the earth that we can touch with our bodily senses, for how is it possible that those who have become spiritual will inherit a sensuous earth? No, they will inherit a spiritual and immaterial earth so as to have on it a dwelling worthy of their glory after they shall be vouchsafed to receive bodies that are bodiless and above every sense. This totally relaxed sense of ease by which Simeon says, of course, not the sensuous earth, this easy way in which he takes the psalm to mean literally its own exact opposite. Uh, yes, the righteous shall inherit the earth, but not like, like the earth, earth. Uh, comes to him, comes to him. I was kind of sarcastic when I was writing this. Uh, co comes to him by, uh, by way of a thousand years of ascetics already living above the flux of nature in the iridescent Minecraft utopia of their male but emasculated daydreams. <laughs> Right? Okay. Rather than, that's maybe a little harsh. Rather than, as Vine Deloria Jr. says, the life in which we are here and now presently engaged, space and the planet Earth. The real planet Earth. The one we can see, hear, smell, taste, touch here and now together with the senses of our human bodies of clay, which is what those senses are for. The language of a religionized Christianity says another unorthodox, orthodox theologian, Christos Ionaris, in his book, Against Religion, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, and, and just to be clear, by a religionized Christianity, he just means Christianity. 
Uh, Christianity as we know it, especially his and my Eastern Orthodoxy, is like his main target. Um, the language of a religionized Christianity lacks an ontological backbone, he says. It swings to and fro in the absence of any reality corresponding to it. It refers to psychological substitutes for the real. Its symbolism points to sentimental assumptions. Its images reflect uh, strictly individual emotional sensitivities. Sentimental suggestiveness is reckoned as real experience. What is especially valued, Yunara says, is a tendency toward mystical states, a saccharine vocabulary and bearing, a theatrical show of rapture or of humility, and what charms is religious addresses of lyrical sensitivity, words full of feeling, rhetorical flights of fervor. And as a rule, all this theatrical behavior has an egocentric and narcissistic character. It operates with the dynamics of satisfying the self, of shoring up the ego. Crucially, these psychological states do not arise out of participation in relations of communion, he goes on to say. And this is really important. This is like, this is heavy, man. This, this is it right here. These psychological states do not arise out of participation in relations of communion. They lie rather at the opposite pole to shared experience. They are individualistic phenomena that insulate one from the dynamics of relation, that imprison one in an egotistic interiority. So it's not just that the saccharine, self-absorbed, cliched language of sentimental Christian religiosity is an unfortunate misuse or even abuse of our human tongue and breath when it would have been better just to sit there in silence and listen to God's own breath of wind moving through the trees. It's rather that this kind of failure of language itself imprisons its users inside their own heads, which is the opposite of salvation or renewed wholeness. The restless but lazy housefly of existential angst, so to speak, allured into a place both sticky and pink by the sweet, sweet smell of easy words about God and infinity and so on, only to be crushed inside the green jaws of the overblown Venus flytrap of the ego. My soul takes wing during worship. I go into myself and despite my weakness, see with the eyes of my soul the unchanging light of his truth. Those are two of the many, many, many such examples that in our sites of the narcissistic, cliched spiritual language so typical of what's become of Christianity even in the supposedly deeper and more authentic East. Astonishingly, he points out that in the entire Philokalia, which triggered a major spiritual renaissance in Russia when it was published there in the late 18th century, then popularized in the anonymous and perhaps fictional travelogue, The Way of the Pilgrim, popularized in the U.S. by... J.D. Salinger's Franny and Zoe. In this entire five-volume collection of Eastern Masonic texts composed over a span of more than a thousand years, there is, Yonara says, quote, not even a hint, end quote, that salvation has anything to do with participation in the life of other people, much less with any form of life here on earth, any other form of life here on earth. Not even a hint. The goal of the Philokalia's contemplation, he says, uh, is presented as purely individualistic if the mind descends into the heart. With the persistent individual practice of asceticism, a person has been saved. Nothing else is needed. There is no need for participation in a body of relations of loving communion. The aim is not to share in existence and life. The death of Christianity is the death of these kinds of dead-end, spiritual but self-absorbed, self-isolating ways of talking about the world. Nothing more, but also nothing less. Perhaps nothing shapes our experience of reality more than how we talk about it together. And so here we are together, working on that. And so the way forward, as I see it, is not just to fall back even harder on the traditional language games of a now long evaporated Christian world order, since they're how we got here in the first place. The way forward is very intentionally re-embodied, de-abstracted, in-person only communal practice in groups both small and circular enough for everyone to relate to one another face to face. Think estuary. 
think Lord's Supper as real meal at actual dinner tables. It's that, but crucially also practices like these nurtured by, imbued by, haloed by, as if by a man of fire, uh, the kind of lion-hearted visionary rec recklessness that's absolutely relentless at searching, searching for new living language in the place where new living language has always sprung forth for poets who have thirsted hard enough for it in the first place. The living earth itself, which sprang forth, as it were, from the womb of Yah at his beautiful word, Yehi, let there be. And in honor of that future yet to dawn, I wish to share my translation of Psalm 104, beginning in verse 10. I want to appreciate how it resituates humans right here where we already are, which is right here where we belong, down at eye level with all the weeds of earth, this earth, the one we can touch with the senses of our body, this body, face to face in relation with the rest of God's creatures who are living down here with us also as they were created to. All right. Oh. Okay. You send forth springs gushing from the wadis, which run between the hills, letting every living thing in the fields drink their fill. The wild asses quench their thirst. The creatures of the sky are coming to dwell along the waters. Look, they're singing from among the branches. He's letting the hillsides drink from his lofty ascent, quenching the earth with the fruitfulness of his works. He springs up grass for all the lumbering beasts and the aromatic herbs and grasses of the field as Adam's servants, that he might bring forth bread from the earth and wine to make our hearts rejoice oil to make our faces shine, bread to refresh and strengthen our hearts. The trees of Yah are overflowing, the cedars of Lebanon which he planted himself, where the birds of sunrise make their nests and the, birds that, the bird that bows her neck in loving kindness. Her home is in the cypresses too, where high mountains are a refuge for gazelles and the cliff towers for the hyrax. He appointed the moon to keep the seasons, the sun knows his gateway in the west, so profoundly so. When you lay down in the darkness, it becomes night, and all the wild beasts of the forest trample about. The, lions, the lion cubs roaring after their prey, seeking their food from the high one. The sun rises again, so that they gather themselves up and lay down, all stretched out and at rest again, in their own little temples of rock. And Adam goes forth to his work and to his service until the evening. O oh, Yah, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you made them all. The earth overflows with all your treasures, just as the sea, great and wide, splashes with numberless living things, both small and great. There stroll the ships. There is Leviathan, that serpentine wreath of chaos, whom you made just to laugh and play with. Everything watches you with patient expectation to give them their food in due season. When you give, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they overflow with good. When you hide your face, their insides flow away. You gather up their breath, they breathe their last and return to their dust. Then you send forth your breath, filling them with life again, renewing the face of the earth. Yes, the radiance of Yah shall outlast the horizon. Yah shall find joy in all his works, the one who gazes at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to Yah as long as I live. I'll keep plucking songs for the highest one again and again, for it's sweet to be swept away in my thoughts of him. Yes, Yah will be my joy when the wanderers are made whole again and holy of earth. Let them be lost no more. Thanks. Wow. Uh, can we become best friends, Graham? This is the first time Graham and I have hung out. We had to like come here to hang out. Um, yeah, uh, let's do it. So now we're going to move on to Karen. <laughs> 